Karasten are soldiers. The Kuhn made it so. They can never vary from that assigned path, never be other than they are meant to be. But they are free to choose within that role, to accept and succeed, or deny and die. Glory is clear and defined. It is an undeniable certainty. He chooses to be, as do we all, long before any of your meaningless freedoms are presented. Atas Shokra, my dear students, and welcome to another lesson of Dragon Age, the history and lore of Thedas, with me, Professor Absalom. Today, we will study the last major race of Thedas, the Tall Oxmen of the North, the giants from beyond the seas, the Kunari. The history, culture, and society of this race of giants is unlike anything else on Thedas, and we will explore a lot of their complexity in this lecture today. Let us begin. Before delving headfirst into today's topics, let me just clear something up about the term Kunari. This is technically not the correct term for this race of horned giants, but rather an umbrella term referring to anyone regardless of race, following the religious ideology of the Kuhn. The original name of the race before it converted to the Kuhn was the name Kossith, but this is currently an antiquated and old term, seldom used or known outside scholarly circles. We have no substantial proof that Kossith referred to the entirety of the race or a specific part of it, nor that the ancient Kossith looked anything like the Kunari of modern day. For the sake of simplicity, I will use the term Kunari in reference to the specific race of people and clarify when I am talking about their predecessors, the Kossith, or converts of other races to the Kuhn. Now that that is out of the way, let us talk about the appearance and physical attributes of this race. Generally standing at least a foot taller than average humans, the Kunari are a race of tall, powerfully built and muscular humanoids. Their skin colors are often metallic in appearance, with bronze, silver and gold tones being common, with browner or grayer pigmentation also occurring. Most Kunari are born with a pair of horns protruding from the side of their skull, and these are one of the most striking characteristics of the race. Though normally only two, there are known examples of Kunari with four, six, or even eight grown-out horns, though exactly what determines the number of horns a Kunari is born with, and whether it has any larger cultural significance, is currently unknown. These horns, however, lack nerve endings and can be removed with sufficient force if the Kunari so pleases, for whatever reason. There are also some Kunari that are born entirely without horns. Within Kunari society, those born without horns, or those who choose not to wear them, have a certain mysticism about them. They are considered to be quite intimidating, strange and imposing. And because of this, many Kunari dissidents, which I will get into later, purposefully remove their horns so as to frighten their foes more easily. This imposing nature, in regards to hornlessness, can have its advantages, however, since hornlessness also is considered as something special and unique, especially by those who rule Kunari society. Because of this, many hornless Kunari can be assigned and given important administrative positions, roles, ranks, or even ambassadorial assignments simply for being hornless. In our first lecture, we talked briefly about the possibilities of lands beyond the borders of Thedas, yet unexplored. Whether this might be the mythical continent of Amaranth across the Amaranthine Ocean, or elsewhere, we are certain of one thing. The Kunari are not native to Thedas, and arrived to the continent from the northeast, beyond the Boeric Ocean. On the other side of the ocean, it is speculated that the original home of the race that they for some reason left behind is located. 
since various sources, like the Kunari sacred text, the Tome of Koslun, makes references to lands, creatures, peoples, and cities, it is safe to assume that the race that became the Kunari came from some sort of civilized society and were aware of these concepts before arriving to Thetis. Before the Kunari arrived to Thetis en masse in the year 630 Steel, there is one lesser known period of history where the predecessors of the Kunari explored Thetis. This occurred in minus 410 Ancient, when a group of what is to believe to be Kosith landed in the Kokari wilds in southern Thetis, at the very edge of the continent. Here, the Kosith established a colony and lived until the emergence of the Darkspawn during the First Blight a couple of decades later. The rampaging Darkspawn destroyed the colony and killed most of the Kosith settlers, as well as presumably capturing some of the female Kossiths. This is presumed because after this event, there emerged a new species of Darkspawn, the Ogres, created through the vile crafts of the Darkspawn from the captured Kossith females. The disgusting details of Darkspawn creation, I am delighted to say, will not be covered today, but will instead be the topic for a future lecture. Suffice it to say, the Horned Race would not appear in Thetis again for nearly a millennia. And when they finally did appear again, their legacy would far outshine that of a simple small colony. In the year 630 Steel, the Kunari arrived en masse to northern Thetis, on board a great fleet of highly advanced warships called Dreadnoughts. The fleet first arrived and landed on the island of Par Volan, the northernmost border of the continent, and the seat of ancient human civilizations. No such strong human realms existed there any longer at the time, and the largely isolated humans of the island were swiftly conquered by the invading force. The Kunari brought the entire island under its control with no word of their arrival or conquest reaching the mainland continent, probably in large part due to, as mentioned, the isolation of the island. With this, the Kunari established themselves on the tropical island, creating a society there and making it their new homeland, before turning their attention towards the rest of Thetis. Only two years after the conquest of Parvolan, the Kunari fleet massed outside the Tevinter-held island of Seheron and the coast of the Kingdom of Ravain in 632 Steel. Thus started the first of many Kunari wars that were to be waged during the next century and a half. The Kunari Wars are an expansive event in Theodosian history that deserves a lecture or lectures dedicated to it in and of itself, but I will summarize the conflict here as consistently as I can. The first war saw the Kunari attacking and overwhelming the majority of northern Thetis, and by the time of 642 Steel, most of Ravain, Antiva, and the Imperium, with the exception of the capital Minrathus, had been conquered. The Kunari's technological superiority in combat, with hitherto unseen gunpowder weapons, used by warships and ground artillery to name a few examples, and the sheer ferocity of the Kunari warriors proved devastating for the armies of northern Thetis. The Kunari also made a huge effort to convert the conquered populace to the ideological ways of the Kun, which met with success in many cases. Many disillusioned humans and elves found new fanatical purposes in the Kunari's fate, and later proved exceedingly difficult to convert back to Andrastianism. 
but there were also many that refused the re-education camps that were set up by the invading Kunari, and as such, many dissidents mysteriously disappeared from common sight, getting worked to death in mines and work camps. Starting to assault the free marshes even further south into the continent, the initial shock of the invasion had now started to wear off on the human populations and armies, and both resentment and resistance now started to rise in the north. By the year 685 Steel, reorganized counteroffensives from the conquered nations, along with major rebellions among humans held in captivity by the Kunari in the Tevinter Imperium, led to the Kunari eventually being pushed back to the by now well-fortified regions of Saharon and Ravain. The conflict had at this point reached into a new age, and by 723 Storm, the two warring sides were suffering from war fatigue and reached a stalemate. Two years later, in 725 Storm, the nations of southern Thedas, seeing the threat that the Kunari posed to the rest of the continent, united under the banner of faith. Having not seen eye to eye since the schism, the Orlesian and Imperial Chantries put aside their differences and launched a combined holy war to reclaim Ravain and Saharon, respectively. This led to three consecutive exalted marches that brought the full might of southern Thedas and its armies into conflict with the Kunari. By using the mages of the Circle of Magi to counter their technologically superior opponents, the Chantry's armies gained a significant advantage over the Kunari armies, since the Kunari were very reluctant to use their own mages in a similar way. After decades of fighting and the plundering of many important Kunari artifacts, including the sacred Tome of Koslun, which ended up in Orle, the Theodosian armies managed to drive the Kunari off the mainland continent and Saharon. The exception to this was the parts of northern Ravain, and in particular the Kunari founded settlement of Kont Ar. After more than 150 years of near non-stop war, the nations of Thedas were exhausted and much of the northern mainland was in ruins. But it was ultimately the huge amount of civilian losses caused by battles waged in Kont Ar that finally brought the Kunari to the negotiating table. A peace treaty was signed between most of the human nations and the Kunari on the island of Lomerin, becoming known as the Lomerin Accord in 785 Storm. This largely ended the conflict and ushered in an uneasy period of peace. Parvolen was ceded to the Horned Giants, and Kont Ar was allowed to remain as the Kunari's last stronghold on the mainland. Only Tevinter refused to sign the Accord, and as such, the conflict between the Imperium and the Kunari have continued, in varying intensity, waxing and waning, up until modern day. The Kunari had pounced on Thedas, and almost succeeded in conquering the entire continent, but had underestimated the stiff resistance and sheer numbers of humanity. Peace, however uneasy, would now reign for the most part, but this would certainly not be the last time in history that Thedas would see conflict with the new masters of Parvolen. During the following centuries, Kunari society as well as the rest of Thedas recovered from the long Kunari wars, but fighting still occurred and flared up now and then between Tevinter and the Kuhn, who were still at war with each other. The latest conflict was in 855 Blessed, when the Kunari invaded Saharon again and managed to take the island back after three years, and now struggle to hold the island because of various resistance groups. 
Attempts were made in 912 Dragon to invade the Tevinter mainland, but all such attempts have, for now, been repelled with great force. The situation remains volatile between the Imperium and the Kuhn. The Kunari did not sit idly by on Parvolan after the end of the Exalted Marches, and have on occasions involved themselves in Theodosian matters, both great and small. Some examples of this can be taken from modern history, specifically in the Dragon Age. During the events of the Fifth Blight in Ferelden from 930 to 931, a squad from the Kunari army's vanguard, the Beresad, were sent south on the direct orders of the army's leader, the Arishok. Their mission was to answer a question, what was the Blight? and thus gather as much information about it as they could. During this mission, the squad was attacked by Darkspawn, and only one of the warriors managed to survive. What exactly happened to the survivor, a warrior with the rank of Sten, is uncertain, since the accounts and sources differ. Some say that he was imprisoned and executed for murder, after having slayed the humans who had found him after the Darkspawn attack and nurtured him back to health. Others claim that he was released from this imprisonment and made to atone for his crime by fighting the coming Blight. Some even suggest he played an instrumental part in eventually defeating the Darkspawn and ending the Blight as a companion to the legendary hero of Ferelden. Whether or not the Arishok's mission in Ferelden were ever fulfilled, and information of the Blight from the Sten ever reached Parvolen, is currently unknown. Another modern historical event pertaining to the Kunari was their arrival in the city of Kirkwall in the Free Marshes. In the year 931 Dragon, a dreadnought carrying the Arishok and a couple of hundred warriors were travelling to Orlais to retrieve the Tome of Koslun, the sacred book that had been taken by the Orlesians during the Kunari Wars. The Orlesians were now willing to return the Tome as a diplomatic gesture to establish ties with the Kunari. This was not to happen, however, as the Tome was stolen at sea by a Ravanian thief. The Kunari Dreadnought gave chase across the Waking Sea and managed to sink the thieves' ship, but they were both caught in a storm, and both the thief and the Arishok, along with his Kunari, were stranded in the free marshes city of Kirkwall. Kirkwall had a problematic history with the Kunari, being conquered and occupied by the Horned Giants for several years during the Kunari Wars but the city's Viscount nonetheless offered a part of the city's port as residence for the new guests as a token of goodwill. The Kunari and the Arishok refused to leave, however, until they had managed to locate and find the tome, and so stayed in the city for several years. And with this, tensions rose between them and the populace of Kirkwall. After years of searching and several provocations against them, the Arishok's patience finally ran out after the tome was snatched from him once again by the same Ravanian thief, a pirate by the name of Isabella. Launching an all-out assault in 934 Dragon, the Arishok and the Kunari attacked the rest of Kirkwall and managed to occupy the city and the ruling Viscount's palace, killing the Viscount and many city guards in the process. Known as the First Battle of Kirkwall, the Kunari were finally defeated and driven from the city by the later proclaimed Champion of Kirkwall, Hawk. Here too, the accounts differ on the ultimate fate of the Arishok, the Tome, and the thief Isabella. Some accounts say that Isabella managed to escape from the city with the Tome, and were not seen again. Others claim that she and the Tome were handed over to the Kunari. Regardless, the Kunari later left Kirkwall, and the remaining leadership of the Kunari 
publicly announced to the rest of Thedas that the Arishok had not acted with the approval of the Kune, denouncing and disavowing the entire attack as unsanctioned by Parvolan. Although centuries have passed, the Kunari have not given up on their aspirations on the rest of southern Thedas. This can easily be seen in the operation known as Dragon's Breath. In 944 Dragon, the Kunari had managed to gain control of a part of the ancient elven portal system, the Illuvians, and used it to attempt to eradicate the leaders of southern Thedas, and thus clearing the way for a future Kunari invasion of the continent. This operation, in part, involved strategic sabotage and assassinations by use of Kunari gunpowder, known as Gatlock, and was approved and sanctioned by the Vidasala, a high-ranking officer in the Kunari priesthood. This operation ultimately failed, however, but was quickly followed up by a renewed all-out attack by the Kunari on Tevinter, which saw the capture of the Tevinter cities of Neromenian, Karastes, and Ventus. This attack was later denounced by the rest of the Kunari leadership, who said that the invasion was unsanctioned by the leaders of the Kunari and that the military, the Antam, had acted on its own. With the history of the Kunari now summarized, we will now move on to the ideological background of the Kunari, the cornerstone of Kunari society, the Kun. The religious ideology known as the Kun is what governs Kunari society overall, but also the day-to-day -day lives of average people within its governance. Founded by the mythical Kossith philosopher Ashkari Koslun, who also penned the most revered and sacred text of the Kunari, called the Tome of Koslun, the Kun revolves around two main concepts. Mastery, Iskun, and Balance, Akun. Other lesser concepts like self-discipline, adherence to order, and collectivism also exemplify the philosophy of Ashkari Koslun. The Kuhn teaches that everything in this world, every creature, every place, and every animal, has a set nature. All things have a place and a purpose according to nature. In nature there is inherently order, and thus to follow one's nature is to attain balance and order, not just for oneself, but for the greater whole of the world. Attaining this balance is ultimately up to each and every being. They have to choose to improve and reach balance in accordance with their nature. This enlightenment is beyond those who refuse to discipline themselves, for if they do not, they will be without purpose and balance. This is why self-discipline, self-sacrifice, self-improvement, and obedience is valued so highly within the Kuhn. A core principle of this philosophy is the concept of Asit Tal Eb, translated to It is to be. Existence in itself is a choice, and what we do with it ultimately is up to us. If we change, we do so because we can and want to. If we do not, we have none to blame but ourselves. True order in the world is reached when all come together to form that order in accordance with nature and work together as a whole. Therefore, a society based on the teachings of the Kuhn are likened to that of a full body organism. This body is split into three parts. The physical body itself, the mind, and the soul. The physical body the legs, arms, eyes, etc., interacts with the outside world and works as an intermediary between the rest of the world and the other two senses. In accordance with this, the people of this society, the Kunari, must be sorted and fitted into one of these three categories and perform their respective duties in order for society to flourish. 
This might all be a bit complex and hard to understand, and for those who have not been born within the Kune, its concepts are quite hard to understand or explain. Suffice it to say, the ideas of this philosophy can be somewhat summarized in an excerpt from the first canto of the Kune. Quote, Existence is a choice. There is no chaos in the world, only complexity. Knowledge of the complex is wisdom. From wisdom of the world comes wisdom of the self. Mastery of the self is mastery of the world. Loss of the self is the source of suffering. Suffering is a choice, and we can refuse it. It is in our own power to create the world, or destroy it." End quote. Before the emergence of the Kyun and Ashkari Koslun, the Kosith apparently worshipped animistic gods, with great temples and priests dedicated to them. But these buildings were later destroyed when the Kyun was implemented as the law of the land, and the priests of the old animistic gods were either converted or driven into exile. As such, no other religions are permitted within Kunari society, since the Kyun is absolute in both spiritual and societal matters. And since the Kyun is absolute, and permits no self-determination, individual freedom is considered next unto a sin in Kunari society. After all, what is individual freedom next to order and stability? a perfect society striving for new heights. Such a society cannot be permitted, by its own ideology, to be constrained by petty freedoms and personal autonomy, and it is by its very nature authoritarian. This is why, even though the Kuhn venerates no gods or deities, it is not an atheistic ideology, but a religious one. The very concepts of the Kuhn are in themselves considered divine, their purpose and power far exceeding that of the ordinary citizen, and stands as a guiding principle against a world of chaos. Now, the astute among you might be thinking to yourself, well, how do you actually implement this ambitious philosophy in a society, and how does it all function in practice? This is what we will discuss now, how the Kunari have formed and crafted their society in interpretation of the Kuhn. Not just a religious philosophy and ideology, the Kuhn gives a clear directive on how a society should be run. Its rulership, administration, laws, societal ranks and hierarchies, gender roles, morals, ethics, and much much more. The Kunari see their society as a singular organism. One body, one creature that all citizens are a part of, and are responsible for. To oversee such a society, at the head of its governance, is the Salasari, or the Triumvirate in common. The Triumvirate consists of three rulers, each representing a part of the societal body, and work in unison to create a whole. The Arishok, who represents the body of the Kuhn, and is the leader of the military, called the Antan. The Arigena, representing the mind, in charge of industry, trade and agriculture, and the Arikun, representing the soul, ruling over the Kunari priesthood, split into two organizations, the Tamasran and the Ben Hasrath. The Antan are the military forces of the Kuhn, the warriors of its army and navy. Acting as the Kuhn's body, that interacts with the rest of Thedas, this is the part of Kunari society that most other Theodosians are familiar with. Organized into a military hierarchy and ranks that define their military life, a warrior of the Antam considers striving towards martial perfection as his duty, and regards his weapon as his soul, and his most valuable possession. This is a common theme in Kunari society, with craftsmen and workers taking great pride in their tools, even considering their tools to contain their very souls. Should a warrior lose his tools or weapons, he is considered disgraced and soulless, 
facing a potential death sentence if he returns home not having found or retrieved his lost weapon. Thus, the Kunari military is famed and feared for being one of the most well-disciplined and ferocious armed forces on the continent. The Tamasran and the Ben Hasrath under the Arakun are two of the most important and unique organizations in Kunari society, having very special and to outsiders quite strange tasks to carry out. The priesthood of the Tamasran, meaning those who speak in their own language, are responsible for educating and fostering the people of the Kuhn, making sure that all are being taught the principles of the Kuhn and fulfill their duty to society. To this end, the Tamasran are in charge of the education, or some would say indoctrination or re-education, of all Kunari citizens. But their influence does not start there, but extends all the way to before the Kunari is even born. The Tamasran administers a nationwide breeding program, carefully pairing and breeding certain individuals to achieve specific genetic traits that are best suited for a societal role. This means that a common Kunari is not allowed to choose whom he or she wants to have children with. That is decided for them by the Tamasran, and offspring are bred for specific purposes rather than conceived out of a personal reason. Children are even named by the Tamasran, and these names are nothing more than a genealogical indicators to keep track of their gene traits for future breeding. The Tamasran's main purpose is also to educate, since the priesthood are some of the most learned and scholarly individuals in Kunari society, and know the principles of the Kuhn better than most. All Kunari, from the day that they are born to their twelfth birthday, are not raised and taught by their parents or families. Instead, they are raised, educated, and evaluated collectively by the Tamasran. When the children reach the age of twelve, they are assigned a role and rank in Kunari society, befitting their skills, and they are not allowed to diverge from this path during their entire life. The Tamasran are also tasked to deal with those individuals who refuse to be taught or re-educated for their own good in this way. Dissidents, captured mages, or those deemed simply to be too obstinate in their resistance to the Kuhn and beyond redemption and re-education, are dealt with by the Tamasran. This is most often dealt with by the use of the Kamek, a type of glowing poison. In small doses it can simply be used as a warning and deterrent, but if used with purpose and to its full extent, the victim is effectively lobotomized and turned into a mindless, memoryless husk and slave who are sent to perform hard labor for the rest of their miserable lives. The Tamasran also care for those of the Kunari who might be born mentally or physically impaired, as well as providing rehabilitation and counseling for Kunari overtly affected by trauma, stress and mental fatigue. This healing process might even include sexual relief, if it is deemed appropriate and necessary. But these milder duties pale in comparison to the overall ruthless practices of this priesthood. They consider themselves to be an important part of the whole, like most Kunari organizations, making sure that the citizens find their way and place in society and nature. The other branch of the Kunari priesthood, the Ben Hasrath, primarily acts as religious and ideological enforcers. Meaning the heart of the many, the Ben Hasrath are the secret police of the Kunari that makes sure that the principles of the Kuhn are upheld and followed within Kunari society. The Ben Hasrath also protects the Kuhn from ideological or religious threats from both within and without Kunari society. This includes re-educating Kunari who fall out of line in society, but also to teach newly recruited or captured converts the benefits of the Kuhn. 
so that they keep to their ordained purpose and do not stray from it, whether they like to or not. In order to protect their society, the Ben Hasrath are also trained as spies and assassins to counter both domestic and foreign threats. As mentioned before, it is the priesthood of the Tamasran that uses the Kamek poison on undesirables, but it is most often members of the Ben Hasrath who lead the interrogations that might lead up to the poison's use, if mages are involved. Speaking of mages, the Kunari are extremely suspicious and fearful towards those who are able to wield magical powers, arguably more so than their human counterparts on mainland Thedas. Nowhere is this shown clearer than in their treatment of their own mages, the individuals simply known as Sarebas, a word and title for all Kunari mages literally meaning dangerous thing. A Sarebas are not given any amount of personal autonomy or freedom, and are constantly under the supervision of a handler known as an Arvarad, one who holds back the evil. Besides hunting down traitors to the Kuhn, the main purpose of an Arvarad is to watch over and keep Sarebases in check. These individuals could, in some ways, be compared to Templars. Since the chance for possession by demons or spirits of the Fade is an ever-present threat to mages and their self-control, and considering that control of the self is one of the most important concepts within Kunari society, a Sarebas are given no freedom whatsoever to speak of, because he is deemed to not be able to control himself in any way. Whereas human and elf mages are most often permitted some limited freedoms inside the circles, this is not the same for the Kunari. Chained and leashed to their Arvarad, wearing great armored pauldrons and often masks to cover their faces, they are never allowed to be on their own. They are prisoners not only of their handler, but also prisoners within themselves. The Arvarad also possesses devices that can incapacitate the Sarebas through either their armor or through special collars. If deemed necessary, a Sarebas' lips might even be sewn shut or his tongue cut out if it is found that he has been practicing forbidden magic. Since they are considered not able to control themselves, they are treated as things, tools and weapons to be used only during the most dire of circumstances. The Sarebas are not beyond sympathy, however, and many Kunari consider them to be the epitome of the most laudable virtue of the Kuhn, the striving for control where none can be attained. This struggle is in the eyes of the Kunari, truly selfless and admirable. This does not mean, however, that magic and those who wield it is treated with any less fear and distrust. The existence of mages within the Kuhn are truly brutal and unforgiving. Now that we have established how Kunari society is governed and ruled, Let's move on to the specific norms, rules, and cultural regulations that govern the everyday lives of Kunari society. First and foremost, the citizen himself is not, strictly speaking, an individual in and of himself, in accordance with the Kuhn. Rather, him and all other members of Kunari society are rather small cogs in the machine, a part of the whole that makes it function. They serve a strict purpose and fulfill a role, rather than being a fully-fledged individual with aspirations and goals of their own, at least according to the Kuhn. A citizen's name is not really an actual name, and is seldom used, but is, as mentioned, rather a genealogical code created by the Tamasran, for the purpose of future breeding. Thusly, a Kunari refer to one another by either their title rank, or by made-up nicknames of their own, if such mutual understanding exists between citizens. Family units, common in other Theodosian societies, do not exist in Kunari society, 
since mating between males and females are simply seen as a duty to the state, rather than for the purpose of creating an emotional bond between individuals and family members. Certain roles within society need to be filled, and so the Kuhn wastes no children and assigns them all a purpose, without the need for a blood family. Their colleagues, who share the same role as them, as well as the state, are their family instead. As mentioned earlier, all Kunari children are raised and educated by the Kunari priesthood until they are assigned their role at the age of 12. This education gives the children a general understanding of Kunari society, the Kun, the roles of society, language, and so on. However, it is most commonly the Tamasran themselves, and those selected to become part of the priesthood, who gains the opportunity to immerse themselves in scholarly pursuits, befitting their role, of course. Due to this, both the Tamasran and the Ben Hasrat are generally more well-educated than other Kunari. A hugely important part of Kunari society is also gender, and specific gender roles. According to the Kuhn and the general philosophy of Kunari culture, males and females excel at specific and different tasks because of their biological sex. And as such, certain roles within Kunari society are inherently meant for either men or women. To give an example, warriors in the military can and are only allowed to be men. And administrative roles within Kunari society, like priests of the Tamasran, are only allowed to be female. This is because the Kunari believe that males are more suited for physical and industrial roles, while females are more suited for administrative and spiritual duties, due to both biological abilities. As such, no matter how well a male might be suited for administrative duties, or a female might show promise as a warrior, the Tamasran will simply ignore this and find a more suitable role because of their gender. There are a number of roles within Kunari society that are specifically gender-coded. The soldiers of the Antam and the priestesses of the Tamasran have already been mentioned, but the leaders of the Triumvirate itself are also bound by their respective genders. The Arishok is always a male, since it is a male gender role, as well as the Arijena is always a female. The Arikun, leader of the priesthood, are however open to both genders, and can be either a man or a woman, as well as the members of the Ben Hasra. All of this does not mean, however, that there sometimes aren't exceptions to these stringent gender rules. Female warriors are technically a part of the Ben Hasrath, but are trained as spies, infiltrators and assassins rather than actual soldiers. Even though it is considered wrong, counterproductive and shameful for Kunari, they will take up other roles than what their gender permits, if commanded to do so but this is, however, exceedingly rare. Kunari society is, as the Kuhn dictates, rigorously ordered and maintained. In rural areas and villages, houses are built around the same mold, built to look more or less the same, structured around straight orthogonal lines. Places of import for production and industry, like farms, fields and workshops, are tended and owned communally. We do not know if this is the case in larger cities, but it might be a plausible possibility. Since Kunari society revolves around the perfection of the self, and the duty towards the Kuhn, every citizen is a part of the whole, and serves the interests of the Triumvirate, the state, and the Kuhn. Thus, there is no such thing as private property in Kunari society since, according to the Kuhn, this would only mean higher maintenance and would be a waste of valuable resources that could be used for the benefit of all, instead of being accumulated by a private citizen for personal and selfish reasons. Wanton materialism and the possession of luxury items, however harmless they might seem, is not practiced or allowed within the Kuhn. 
Kunari economics also reflects this system, since there is no currency and no bartering and selling of goods within Kunari society. The merchants, for lack of a better word, that do exist could be more likened to overseers that make sure that the right amount of products are produced and distributed appropriately. This is not the case, however, when it comes to the rest of Thedas. The Kunari eagerly trades goods and services, in the more commercial sense, with people from beyond their own lands. But this is not for any economic gain, but rather for the purposes of conversion and information gathering. The Kunari are very curious about how the people beyond the Kune live, and thus they aim to learn as much about foreign cultures as possible through trade, so that they can not only improve their own society, but also convince more outsiders to convert and join the Kune. Life and death in service to the Kune is not only an honor within Kunari society, it is considered an obligated duty by every Kunari citizen that serves the whole in their own way. The Kunari refer to the Fade as the land of the dead, but it is unclear whether or not it is believed that they go there after they die. The Fade is, however, strictly prohibited to enter alive by the laws of the Kune itself, and a Kunari vehemently refutes the notion that they visit the Fade in dreams, like humans or elves. They claim to not dream like other races dream, and since they are so rarely encountered in the Fade, there is little evidence to the contrary. The Kunari also claim that their souls are not necessarily linked to their bodies in the same way as other races, but rather that the soul of a Kunari resides in the tools associated with their respective task in society. When the body dies, the tools that contain the soul can then be retrieved and be of further use to future generations of the Kunari of the same role. The Kunari, lastly, have a strange respect for dragons, naming them as Atashi, meaning glorious ones in their own language of Kunlat. It has been hypothesized that they hold these creatures in such high regard because of their physical prowess, or because of the similarities between dragons and Kunari, both being horned creatures. Maybe it is a remnant of their ancient past when the Kunari worshipped animistic and bestial gods. No one except the Kunari themselves really know why they are held in such high regard. But unlike a culture such as the Tevinter Imperium, who also hold dragons in high regard, the Kunari does not extend this appreciation to reverence, however, as the Kune strictly prohibits any other form of principle or creature to be held more in reverence than the Kuhn itself. And thus, dragons, however mighty they can be, are still subject to the Kuhn according to the Kunari, as all life ultimately is. The Kunari are one of the most technologically advanced races in Thedas. Surpassed only by the dwarves, Kunari science and technology can very much be traced to the innovation known as Gatlock, the Kunari's very own explosive black powder. This compound, its formula a closely guarded secret up until the year 944 when a version of the recipe was recovered from the Ben Hasrath, is safer to use than the lyrium crafted explosives that dwarves already possess, and can be used by anyone. It is also more applicable in weapon manufacturing giving rise to cannons and the mighty seafaring dreadnoughts, massive floating fortresses more so than ships made of wood and propelled with oars that are armed with said cannons. It was these weapons that brought the Kunari such overwhelming victories during the Kunari Wars, and a testament to their willingness to rely on manufactured arms and new technologies rather than mages, in stark contrast to humans. Another technological invention of the Kune, also centered around warfare and weapons, is the virulent poison called Sarkamek. Deadly to all races except Kunari, it causes blind rage and madness to anyone affected by it, followed closely thereafter by death. 
applicable either as a poisonous gas or smeared on blades, a common strategy among the Antan is to use this poison to sow dissent and chaos among enemies, and use the poisoned victims as tools to soften up resistance or spread ruin among the enemies of the Kuhn. Antidotes for this poison do exist, but we have no idea how well known or widespread this is. Whether this poison has any connection to the Kamek that is used by the Tamasran is uncertain. Linguistically, the two items seem to share a similar meaning, but since it is unknown exactly what the term Sarkamek means in Kunlat, the full connection is not known. The advanced society of the Kunari are capable of more civic forms of advancement, such as the sophisticated architecture of Kunandar, the capital of the Kunari on Par Volan. The masterfully constructed domes and efficient aqueducts supplying water to its inhabitants, not to mention the shape of the entire city to liken that of a great beehive, does show the advanced nature of Kunari engineering technology. But despite this, it does seem like the main focus of Kunari science and technology is centered around warfare, conquest, and the subjugation of others. Those outside of the Kuhn, the numerous humans, dwarves, and elves in the rest of Thedas, are known to the Kunari simply as Bas, a word meaning thing. Seen as foreigners with no true purpose, the highest honor that can be bestowed to a Bas outside of the Kuhn is the rare title of Basalit An, a respected foreigner and a worthy foe who, although he is not as honored and wise as someone who has embraced the Kuhn, can still be treated and reasoned with. Every Bas has potential, however, according to the Kunari, and if the wisdom of the Kuhn is shared with them, they can indeed reach their full potential and serve a greater purpose than themselves. Willing conversion to the Kuhn is not uncommon, especially in parts of northern Thedas. Many individuals from Ravain and elven slaves from Tevinter are two demographics that commonly join the Kuhn from outside its territory, or who are willing to convert if lands are conquered. Since the Kunari still have a presence in northern Ravain and contested parts of Tevinter, these are where most converts arrive from, but converts from other parts of the continent do also show up from time to time. Many who seek the Kuhn are often downtrodden and oppressed people, desperate and yearning for purpose in a life where they have found none. Others have been persuaded through trade with the Kunari, like we mentioned earlier, and might simply join out of ideological reasons. But the Kuhn is also, most often, spread through war. Besides being known as Bas, when the Kunari conquer new territory, the non-Kunari peoples of said territory and the nations yet to be conquered are known as the Kebethari, meaning simple people. These Kebethari are unenlightened and without purpose, and must, according to the Kunari, be given the wisdom of the Kuhn so that they can become useful. And the way to enlighten these Kebethari is through conversion or re-education, or indoctrination, as some would call it. This process usually goes something like this. The conquered people are given over to the custody of the Ben Hasrath, who are in charge of their re-education and assimilation into Kunari society. Adults and prisoners of war are sent to learning and labor camps, where they are given simple lodgings and spend their time studying the scriptures of the Kuhn, as well as performing manual labor to learn the value of work and discipline. Children of conquered peoples are separated from their families and parents and forced into the arms of the Tamasran, who raises them like any other Kunari. If this entire ordeal is met with little or no resistance from the conquered peoples in question, they become Vidathari, newly converted members of the Kuhn who are non-Kunari in origin. After their re-education, they are given a role and a title like everyone else, and are expected to carry out their sworn duty to the Kuhn. 
Those among the conquered who refuse this indoctrination, however, face grave consequences from their enlightened conquerors. Dissent and resistance, both from within Kunari society but also from new converts, are treated as a curable ailment by the Ben Hasrath, and undesirable elements among the converts are taken to healing temples known as Vidathloks. The exact methods used on problematic converts by the Ben Hasrath is not entirely known, but several sources indicate that the converts are either tortured both physically and mentally until compliance, treated with a kamek and turned into mindless slaves like previously discussed, or just outright killed or taken care of in another way. As one eyewitness, a captured Tevinter soldier, recalls, quote, Some of my platoon resisted the indoctrination, refusing even to pretend. The Ben Hasrath see rebellion and discontent as an illness that can be cured, and they took these men to the Vidathlok, temples dedicated to healing and recovery. I do not know what happened there. The men who returned were changed in profound ways. Others we never saw again. I can only assume the cure did not take." End quote. There are those who turn away from the Kuhn after having grown up within it or having converted to it. These deserters and dissidents, who, according to most Kunari, are outright traitors, are known under the umbrella term Talvashoth, meaning true grey ones. These individuals and groups are not to be confused with the term Vashoth, which refers to the few Kunari who since their birth have grown up outside the Kuhn. The Talvashoth are Kunari, or Vidathari, who have chosen to abandon the Kuhn and live outside it. Whether for ideological or personal reasons, they chose a different lifestyle. Since Kunari are quite rare outside the Kuhn, and many Theodosians automatically associate the Oxmen with the Kuhn, Talvashoth usually live out their lives in smaller, isolated groups and villages away from civilization and prying eyes. Others take up professions like mercenaries and hired soldiers to earn a living and survive. Many Talvashoth are former members of the Antam and have a lot of experience when it comes to martial matters. The majority of Talvashoth simply want to be left alone after leaving the Kuhn, and live out their lives as they see fit. There are however those Talvashoth who engage in active combat and guerrilla warfare against those who serve the Kuhn. A trend among Talvashoth is to either cut off parts of or remove their horns entirely, so as to appear more frightening and scary to their Kunari foes. As I have hopefully made clear by this point, the Talvashoth is not a unified group or a resistance movement, but simply a term for those who have left the Kuhn. Those who might struggle to survive outside the Kuhn as Talvashoth can often turn to simple banditry to survive. The Talvashoth who actively fight against their former masters usually strike against lightly defended targets like trade caravans and isolated outposts. Since their small size and often lack of cohesion does not permit the Talvashoth to go up against their numerically superior foes in the Antan. The Kuhn treats the Talvashoth with varying degrees of severity. If the Ben Hasrath find any fugitive Talvashoth, they are re-educated like any other criminal or lawbreaker. If that doesn't work, or if the captive proves uncooperative, other more forceful methods are put into place to deal with the traitors to the Kuhn. The language of the Kunari and the Kuhn is called Kuhnlat. Though straightforward and encompassing, just like the Kuhn itself, this language nonetheless places a lot of emphasis on metaphors. A word can have many different meanings depending on the context. The word Antam literally means body and is allegorical for the military that acts as the body of the Kuhn, but it is also the word for cuirass. The phrase I started this lecture with, Atash Shokra, 
is a greeting meaning glorious struggle, while panahedan, meaning take refuge in safety, is a term for goodbye or farewell. There are very few kunari, besides the higher ranks of society and the priesthood, that speaks any other languages than Kunlat. Many see no need to learn more languages than this, since the Kun puts emphasis on mastering certain abilities to its full extent. Not having fully grasped language is sometimes seen as shameful within the Kun, and this is one of the reasons Kunari do not speak much around foreigners, even if they have a passing understanding of the common tongue. While their exact origins are unknown, the Kunari have certainly left their mark on the continent of Thedas, and are there to stay, for better or for worse. Determined, disciplined, and mighty, their faith unshakable in the words of the Kuhn, the race's different way of life is a fascinating and sharp contrast to the rest of the continent, and the fate of the Kunari and all those who choose to follow them is now entwined with that of Thedas. That will be all for this lecture. The assignment for this week will be specific chapters in the Tome of Kosloon that you'll have to read until next we meet. Now, since we have covered all of the major races of Thedas, we will now move on to other subjects of import. Next lecture, the topic will be about magic and the Fade, so be sure to prepare yourself for that. Until then, I have been Professor Absalom, and I will see you in the next lecture. Thank you very much for watching this video. If you enjoy the content, be sure to subscribe, like, comment, and check out the other videos on the channel. More interesting lore videos will be coming in the future, so keep an eye out. Thank you once again, and until next time, have a good one.